we'll just zoom through here. Okay, the BCFP, the Bureau of Consumer Financial Protection. This is one of the more controversial parts of Dodd-Frank, the BCFP. Okay, it was developed in the aftermath of the subprime mortgage crisis because it was decided by the government that a major cause of the subprime mortgage, mortgage crisis was the inability of consumers, ordinary moms and pops, to protect themselves from their own excesses, okay, and also their own ignorance. So a lot of what was going on in the housing market leading up to the subprime mortgage crisis was predatory lending. Predatory lending by mortgage originators who targeted people who were financially illiterate or didn't understand exotic financial products. And so the BCFP was an attempt to remedy this. And the way the government went about this was remedying people's financial ignorance by restricting their access to certain kinds of financial products. And that was why the BCFP was uh, controversial, was because it was protecting people for their own good. Okay, uh, let me say a couple things about it. It's an independent bureau at the Federal Reserve. Uh, actually, I guess, is everybody familiar with the Federal Reserve? You guys all know what that is? What's the Federal Reserve? It is not exactly the FDIC, no. It is the Bank of Banks, is what the it is. Bank. What's that? The National Bank. Um, not quite. It's a, it's a bit different than a, a national bank would um, be. Isn't it the one that's in New York? There are multiple different uh, federal reserves, yes, but it's all housed under a single entity. Yeah, there's one in Dallas, one in New York, St. Louis, San Francisco, different cities. Okay. Um, it's a bank of banks and they lend money to banks and they set interest rates that then serve as a kind of a baseline for banks to set interest rates and there's a trickle down effect that proceeds throughout the financial system through institutional banking that is set by the federal reserve okay so that uh, we can go it's like a labyrinthine and the federal reserve actually has come to serve i think as a shadow government in this country uh, but it's a labyrinthine kind of a system that uh, is incredibly powerful, more powerful than maybe any other financial force on the planet. But the BCFP is an independent bureau at the Federal Reserve, and it's not subject to Federal Reserve review. Okay, here's a quick uh, summary quote. Uh, this is boilerplate stuff from the website. To regulate the offering and provision of consumer financial products or services under the federal consumer financial laws. A couple more uh, points to describe what the BCFP does. Again, boilerplate from the website. Job is to coordinate with other federal and state regulatory agencies to promote consistent treatment of consumer financial and investment products and services. This includes the establishment of a victim relief fund. Again, uh, the idea is to implement and enforce the federal consumer financial protection laws consistently for the purpose of ensuring that all consumers have access to markets for consumer financial products and services, and that markets for consumer financial products and services are fair, transparent, and competitive. Okay, now, I think that uh, the BCFP does a lot of good. The BCFP also, though, is very controversial, and probably for good reason because the way they go about protecting mom and pop from predation is by restricting mom and pop, moms and pops access to certain kinds of financial products. They do this by classifying some in, um, investors and customers as sophisticated and others as unsophisticated. And the criterion that is used is how much wealth you have. And I guess the assumption there, the background assumption is that if you have a lot of wealth, you must have been smart enough to be able to get it, so you must be a sophisticated investor or consumer. Uh, even though, of course, some people inherit theirs or, or get it through the lottery or some other means. Uh, but the BCFP is a wide-ranging entity that does a bunch of different uh, things to protect consumers. Okay, and it does things including providing consumers with timely and um, understandable information, protects them from unfair, deceptive, or abusive acts and practices, promotes consistent enforcement, 
It uh, promotes also transparent, efficient markets to facilitate access and innovation. Finally, it does financial education programs, fields consumer complaints, identifies risks, etc. Let's look at part four of Dodd-Frank. This is the disclosure and corporate governance provisions of the act. Okay, prior to the uh, great financial crisis of 2008-2009, it was characteristic for executives to uh, just vote out compensation schemes for themselves without consulting their stockholders. And by vote out, I mean board of directors style votes. Okay, and now there have to be formal stockholder votes on executive compensation. I wouldn't say that this exactly keeps executives from engaging in uh, deceptive or aggressive kinds of compensation schemes. It does serve as a speed limit for them, but still they do pull it off. For instance, uh, Elon Musk's compensation scheme at Tesla is one of the most outrageous things I've ever seen in business. And it will enrich him massively at the expense of uh, Tesla shareholders who uh, he uses as kind of an ATM uh, to enrich himself, okay? And um, that's the sort of thing that execs still do, and they can get it through as long as uh, they can rig the votes uh, like he does, but formally they do have to vote now. Uh, there are now additional executive compensation disclosure requirements, um, heightened compensation committee standards for listed companies, et cetera. Finally, whistleblower provisions are strengthened by Dodd-Frank. Okay, it was decided after the great financial crisis that Sarbanes-Oxley was insufficient to uh, protect whistleblowers and that these provisions for whistleblower protection in Sarbanes that are there in Sarbanes-Oxley needed to be strengthened further. So protection has been now expanded to persons who provide original information on any securities law violation. Okay, um, there are also monetary sanctions that are more substantive and also bounties that can be given to whistleblowers. So 10 to 30% of all collected monetary sanctions can now be given to whistleblowers, as well as prohibitions against retaliation, which has which unfortunately is endemic in a lot of business, that persons who do go public about their knowledge of um, scandalous actions get retaliated against. Okay, questions or comments about the last part of Dodd-Frank? This is actually it, so. Any questions or comments about the last part of Dodd-Frank? Look at the video from Monday to see the first part of Dodd-Frank. Okay. Uh, the way regulation works in this country, and this is me off-roading, this is not uh, some formal assertion. The way regulation works uh, in this country and in most capitalist economies is whenever there's a big financial blow-up or crisis or malfunction, the government, on the back of popular opinion, uh, rushes in and regulates for the last crisis. And this is successful for a time and it successfully prevents that particular problem from happening again. But the regulations typically are onerous and expensive. The regulations are hard to comply with, and they're very bureaucratic and uh, difficult for companies. And so over time, companies complain, and the memory of the scandal or the, the blow up, the meltdown is lost. And over time, those regulations get loosened. And then the government encounters another uh, meltdown. Maybe there's still another crisis, right? And the regulations get tightened again, again, retrospectively uh, looking uh, the whole time. Okay, and so it goes. The cycle is tightening, loosening, tightening, loosening, and it's based on uh, popular opinion. And currently we are still in a loosening phase where a lot of Dodd-Frank is now being loosened and provisions are being rolled back because they are, of course, hard to comply with. I think that when we look back on this phase, we will see that it is actually right now an incredibly fraudulent phase in the business cycle. A large number of the, biz, of the companies at the end of a bull market run, and we are in a very long one now, uh, tend to be fraudulent. Okay, by large number, I don't mean like you know 20% or something. It's smaller than that. But uh, we are kind of in a golden age of fraud at this time.
and I think that we will face a tightened regulatory situation uh, the next time a bear market arrives uh, to accompany a, a deep recession. Okay, and I'm, I'm not sure if this whole COVID thing counts as that uh, because of the government's incredible flooding of liquidity into the, the markets. But uh, on behalf of regulations, even though they are expensive to comply with and even though they are very onerous and hard to, um, they make it hard for an honest person sometimes to do business because of the bureaucratic hoops. Still, on behalf of regulations, they help prevent things like this, the Barings Bank case. Okay, so they help slow down or stop rogue operations. Barings Bank is a very famous case. Uh, it has a historic... Uh, uh, story to the company starting back in the 1700s. Uh, Bearings Bank uh, acted as uh, London brokers for a lot of business deals, including the uh, wars of uh, the United Kingdom over many centuries. Most famously recently, though, the bank collapsed in 1995 after losing 827 million pounds, which is equal to about 1.6 billion pounds today. Okay, uh, fraudulent investments and in futures contracts by a single rogue trader, Nick Leeson, brought about the downfall. He was based in Singapore, and he was supposed to be making arbitrage plays. But he held on to the contracts that he was trading in, gambling on the future direction of the Japanese markets instead of buying on one market and immediately selling on another market for a small profit. Uh, generally speaking, if you're not familiar with arbitrage, arbitrage is where you uh, buy your eggs or your wheat or your corn in one market where they're cheap and you sell them when they're dear in another market. Okay, it's, it's simply uh, taking advantage of temporal or geographical differences. He didn't do that, didn't stick with the schedule, instead tried to uh, gamble. Leeson falsified trading records in the bank's computer systems and used money intended for margin payments on other trading. As a result, he appeared to be making substantial profits. Okay, Baring's bank auditors finally discovered the fraud around the same time that the chairman, Peter Baring, received a confession note from Leeson. Leeson left a confession note and went on the lam. Um, he was able to do these things because of several, uh, lack, se several features in the bank that signal a lack of regulatory oversight. Okay, for instance, he operated in both the dealing desk and the back office. He was not questioned because he was initially successful and initially brought a substantial number of profits in. In fact, uh, the year before he began gambling wildly, um, the profits that he made from his trading uh, were a large percentage of the bank's overall profits. There's a general lack of surveillance uh, in the back office, um, and the accounting uh, regulation procedures were inefficient. Here's some newspaper clippings. Here's a quotation from Leeson. We were all driven to make profits, profits, and more profits. I was the rising star. In 1993, he, in fact, was responsible for 10% of the company's profits, he himself. But he began to hide his losses in a secret account, and while trading, continued to inflate his earnings and hide his losses. Again, a lack of regulatory oversight because he was initially successful. Two years later, a secret file was found that showed Leeson had gambled 827 million pounds in the bank's funds, which is about $2 billion in today's dollars. He left a note in the firm's Singapore office saying, I'm sorry, and went on the run. Okay, Bearings Bank was eventually bought in 1995 for one pound, uh, and so the name is still valuable, uh, even though the bank, of course, is insolvent. So uh, the name uh, as a brand was bought for one pound, and various parts of the bank were split up um, U.S.-based operations were split, asset management division, financial services were split and acquired by various other companies. The name still exists, the corporation does not. Leeson booked a late night flight to London, intending to surrender to the British police with the hope of serving prison time in the U.K. rather than Singapore. Look, you do not want to ever do prison time in Singapore. <laughs> Whatever you do in life, don't get caught doing prison time in Singapore. Uh, he was stopped in Frankfurt by German authorities and was in their custody for several months while unsuccessfully fighting extradition. Uh, he eventually was extradited back to Singapore and served six and a half years in prison there, but then British authorities managed to pursue extradition and got, got him to the UK. Okay, he got released two and a half years early overall due to having colon cancer. 
I wish I could say that uh, he's rotting still, but he is not. He um, moved to Ireland, had a son, became the chief executive of a football club, and then worked as a debt advisory official. He now gives hundreds of talks about how he destroyed bearings. Every talk gives him about $8,000. He has made 200,000 pounds from a book deal and over 7 million from royalties from the movie Rogue Trader, which was made about him. Um, here's a quotation from uh, the former director of Bearings Bank. He was sorry it had happened, but it was very matter of fact. He seems to blame the system as opposed to the fact that he is a ruthless, unscrupulous cheat and liar. That's what it boils down to. Okay, uh, cases like Nick Leeson's case and the Bearings Bank case are rare. It's rare for uh, rogue operators to have this much financial power and to do this much destruction. But when they do happen, they're catastrophic, and regulations do help prevent that from happening. So even when, regulation, even when regulations are onerous and hard to comply with, still they do help prevent uh, these catastrophic kinds of circumstances. Although the downside is that for all the honest people, they end up being uh, uh, you know, a hard bureaucratic hurdle to jump through. The Nick Leeson case is similar also to the uh, Jordan Belfort case. Okay, uh, I hope we'll get a chance to do the Jordan Belfort case before the end of the semester. You guys all remember the Wolf of Wall Street movie? Okay, uh, apparently, according to Belfort, the things depicted in that movie were actually uh, less than what they really did. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> One wonders what was, a, uh, you know, the extent of it. But um, rogue operators like that, when regulations are extensive and are enforced, uh, get shut down, and that's a valuable service of the regulations. Any questions about the Bearings Bank case? Okay, go ahead and tap the lights again for us, uh, Chloe. Um, I want to actually scoot ahead now. Okay, and um, I want to take today to move ahead in our syllabus just a little bit. I think we're going to be uh, pausing to do some case study inquiries next week. So I want to take the last 10 minutes of class today to uh, look at the beginning of the next module. Okay, if you have your business ethics in action book, go ahead and pull it out. And I don't expect you to have read this uh, section yet, but we are going to go to the environmental business ethics section on page 345. Okay, page 345. And let me just summarize. Again, I don't expect you to have read this already, but let me just summarize this Bhopal case. This is the famous industrial accident. Okay, in Bhopal, India, in 1984, the worst industrial accident of all time occurred. Okay, and I'll just read a little bit from page 345. It occurred in the city of Bhopal, Madhya Pradesh, a, a state in central India. The direct cause of the tragedy was the leakage of 40 tons of methyl isocyanate, a gas used to make pesticides. Cocktails of deadly gases began drifting in clouds through the densely populated city streets. As a consequence, 6,900 people died, many in their sleep. In the following days and months, thousands of people waited for help in the streets. Up to a total of 20,000 lost their lives during the following years. In addition, 20,000 were severely harmed and 850,000 were affected. Okay, the government of India controlled information pertaining to the accident that had occurred in order to maintain its political legitimacy. The plant was run by Union Carbide. Uh, Union Carbide is, of course, a major chemical operation, has been for many years in the United States, but this is a, an Indian subsidiary of Union Carbide. Okay, and this is a really famous case, uh, you know, rightly so, because it's the biggest industrial disaster of all time. It's a really famous case because uh, it embodies within it the standard structure for a lot of such cases, okay? The, the structure is the same as the structure for the Exxon Valdez disaster here in the United States that happened in Alaska, and the same as the BP um, Macondo oil well blowout that happened here off the Gulf Coast uh, a few years ago. Some of us maybe remember that, yes? A few of us, okay. That was a big story in Houston, for sure, because most of the people involved in that came from Houston. Um, and the structure is as follows. 
it is most of the time cheaper to do as little as possible for the environment. As little as you can, as little as possible. Okay, it is cheaper to do minimal safety updates. It is cheaper to implement minimal environmental filtering or minimal environmental protection measures. Okay, and most of the time also, companies that do implement or do take that minimalist route and comply as little as possible with the law or even uh, don't comply at all, maybe just present the appearance of compliance, most of the time companies that do take that route, they get away with it for a while. Okay, maybe some of them get away with it permanently, we never know. But most of them get away with it for a while until they don't. And this Bhopal case is famous because it's an incident where the Union Carbide Company got away with non-compliance for a while. There wasn't a substantive safety procedure operation in place. They didn't have redundant uh, mechanisms of uh, protection in this chemical plant. Okay, there weren't redundant risk procedures that were available. When one failed, they could just turn to another. They didn't have all that. Uh, Union Carbide got away with it for a while and were successful financially as a result. In fact, they were more successful financially than they otherwise would have been if they had spent more money on safety and environmental protection until they didn't get away with it. Okay, and when they didn't get away with it, it was, in fact, disastrous. This is like radically destructive, massively destructive. The BP oil disaster here off the Gulf Coast brought the entire company, this uh, international uh, conglomerate, to its knees. And the same is true for this Bhopal case. Okay, and it's instructive for us as we think about the relationship between the business and the environment to think about the issue of uh, how much is enough in terms of safety and environmental protection. How much is too much? You obviously are running a business here where you're trying to be profitable. But how much is enough? Should you err on the side of more protections, more safety? Should you try to go the minimalist route? Okay, I suspect that all the other chemical companies operating in India who were Union Carbide's immediate competitors were probably doing similar things. Okay, just like I suspect that BP's competitors out here in the Gulf Coast were probably doing similar things as BP was doing when BP was cutting all sorts of safety and procedural corners prior to the, um, the Deepwater Horizon oil well blowout. And they probably, all these competitors, didn't get caught with their hands in the cookie jar. Okay, but Union Carbide did. And BP did. And so what you're looking at is a scenario where the odds of a huge catastrophic tail risk event are very low. But when that event does happen, if it does happen, it's really bad. Okay, it's really, really bad. And this is, a, like I said, a structure that gets repeated all sorts of times um, in the course of, our investi uh, of one's investigations of, of these kinds of cases. Let me stop and ask if there are any comments or questions before I say a couple more things about the relationship between business and the environment. Questions about the Bhopal case? Okay, let me say a couple more things about uh, business and the environment. Okay, these are just some general comments. With a few exceptions, almost everyone these days would say prioritizing 
environmental issues, to some extent at least, is a valuable, worthwhile thing. In fact, almost everybody would agree that prioritizing environmental issues, protecting and preserving the environment, is a valuable and worthwhile thing. And that includes people in business. That includes CEOs. That includes CFOs who are looking at the bottom line. Again, they would say this in theory. But the reality on the ground is that actually business has a pretty bad reputation when it comes to its relationship with environmental issues. If you were to look at statistical surveys of the general public's perception of business vis-a-vis -vis the environment, they would be pretty negative. Okay, and it's based, of course, on a long history of cases where the, um, the coal companies present the appearance of complying with uh, filtering regulations while, in fact, trying not to, or uh, the chemical companies dumping their chemicals secretly in the river, or um, the logging company secretly uh, destroying part of the forest to maximize profits and that sort of thing. Okay, almost everybody in theory agrees that a business should do right by the environment. But it is in practice where we find businesses not doing right by the environment. Okay, and this has often been said to be a weakness of capitalism. And this is something maybe we can explore in the next week or two as we do this uh, mini module on business and the environment. This is often said to be a weakness of capitalism because the competitive pressures of capitalism, which are so good at forcing companies to be efficient and to find creative, innovative ways to make their products, also incentivize companies at the same time to cut corners when it comes to environmental preservation and protection just like they also incentivize companies to cut corners when it comes to treating human beings with dignity and respect. The competitive pressures, the awareness that your competition is out there every day trying to beat you by finding a more efficient way to do what you are doing than you have found and trying to outsell you and take market share from you, those competitive pressures end up forcing, or at least the, the feeling, the perception is among business persons that they, they are coerced to some extent, those competitive pressures make it very difficult for business persons to do right by the environment. Okay, they make it really, really hard to take a hit on your margin this quarter for the sake of more safety precautions. Okay, so although everybody in theory basically agrees at this point that it's good for business to do right by the environment, in practice, what happens is often secret non-compliance or often just the presentation of virtue signaling but the reality of, of doing the opposite. Or even some companies, a very few of them, you know, just openly uh, refusing to, uh, to cooperate. Okay, so it's a very difficult, fraught issue to this day and will continue to be for a long time because of these conflicting kinds of ideals. Okay, in one sense, you've got this high-minded collective group ideal, which I think was wonderful that most human beings now have, at least in the West, that we need to do right by the environment, preserve and protect it. And in another sense, at the same time, businesses all over almost always find it not in their immediate self-interest to actually do so because of the competitive pressures of their circumstances. Okay, so those are so just some general comments, and we'll talk about ways to sort that issue and maybe resolve some of these confl conflicts and tensions in the course of this uh, mini-module over the next week. Any questions or comments about uh, those uh, last comments about business and the environment? Questions or comments? Okay, we'll let that be the last word then. It's good to see you all. I'm looking forward to going through this movie list. <laughs>